as, as you know, uh, Latin American region is a region with many challenges, so I do need to wear many hats. Um, I do advocacy for LGBT and sexual rights, as well as to facilitate the access to water, to uh, digitalization uh, to seniors, and also advocate for mental health. Uh, my daily work includes litigation of the cases before the European Court of Human Rights and also execution of judgments and decisions before the Committee of Ministers. It includes the cases of prohibition of torture, uh, the crimes committed by law enforcement officials, separate surveillance and also LGBTQI community rights. Yeah, thanks. Um, it's environmental violation and also a discrimination against uh, women traditional leadership. Uh, I work extensively with human rights uh, defenders from the East Horn of Central Africa and the human rights violations that I confront most on a daily basis uh, is the harassment of human rights defenders by governments or by corporations or by other powerful interest groups who are keen to silence the work that human rights defenders do. This takes the form of for example, you have so many human rights defenders uh, face uh, arrests or harassment by police. Uh, some of them will be dragged before court uh, on the pretext that they are violating anti-terrorism laws. And some human rights defenders also have their property or equipment confiscated. And when they try and take part in public mobilization, sometimes they're subjected to beatings uh, or even arrests or humiliation by security forces. As a member of the Tunisian League for Human Rights and Defense, which is a Nobel Prize winner, and it's the, the biggest organization defending human rights in both the, uh, the Arab world and uh, uh, the African uh, continent, we, uh, de we dealt with receiving complaints from citizen citizens which are uh, victims of police brutalities, police, uh, police, uh, police uh, violations, and uh, human rights violation uh, generally. And the, the most important uh, human rights violation is uh, those police brutalities and the impunity after one's violation is condemned. What I need the most is like monitoring and safety tools so I can keep doing on my work. To confront violations, uh, from my perspective as an um, international litigation lawyer, first the effective litigation is needed, but I think that uh, one of the most key uh, aspects of it is also to work for the execution of judgments before the Committee of Ministers, which also demands the human resource. For uh, So as of now, uh, the resource that I need is the human resource in my department. Yeah, firstly is, the, is that we operate with, our, with zero budget, so we need a sort of financial support. But more important is that we need a support to ensure that we're able to do community meetings, able to raise awareness to the community, and able to take the matter to court. That's the support which we need. I think one of the most important things that uh, human rights defenders need for their work is actually for the public uh, to be able to show support or solidarity with human rights defenders. Uh, a lot of the violations that are committed against human rights defenders usually rely on the fact uh, that uh, violators of these human rights uh, want to demonstrate that these human rights defenders do not have the support of the public or they are not speaking out on behalf of the public. So one of the best ways to support human rights defenders is actually to create public awareness around what they are doing so that the public can get bought in. But I also think uh, it's important for human rights defenders to have a readily available means of safe passage when they face risk to have financial resources and networks that will help them overcome or mitigate some of these risks. And ultimately, in the most dangerous cases, they need to have uh, pathways to either get to safe uh, locations and to also uh, continue making a living, you know, even as they're working as human rights defenders. Uh, usually when the work of a human rights defender is usually disrupted, some of them face uh, poverty, exclusion or stigmatization and I think 
it's really important for us to send a message that it's okay for someone to fight or defend human rights and still have a life and a career outside the human rights that they focus on. Uh, networking, basically, exchanging of experience within other perspectives from worldwide, uh, getting some health, uh, uh, mental health uh, assessment sometimes, since we receive the victims and we uh, do audiences to, to, to catch out with the, the cases abuses, and that, that needs uh, some health assessment, as I said, uh, getting to know, to, to develop more scientific knowledges, some partnerships uh, abroad in order, in order to enlarge this expertise and to make it more efficient. I think that for um, all human rights defenders, uh, daily life is more or less the same. You do not have the work and private life balance and you should be always on, uh, on spot where the human rights uh, violations happen? Uh, the daily life is, is a mix of both exciting, uh, terrifying at times, uh, but very challenging, uh, I'd say in general, because uh, we usually have to deal with cases where we're supporting human rights defenders who are either at risk, uh, but uh, in some cases uh, we get to celebrate some of the small victories, uh, whether it's a human rights defender released from court, where they're able to secure funding or when they're able to achieve the impact from their work. So the daily life involves a lot of communication. I spend a lot of time uh, on calls uh, and when not in the office, uh, obviously after the COVID-19 pandemic nowadays, uh, we're usually uh, in meetings with these human rights uh, defenders. So it, it, it really depends uh, on what we're doing at the particular time, uh, but a lot of it is heavily based uh, on calls and physical communication. We are being threatened. I've been sued for two million. And sometimes is that the traditional leadership in the community doesn't want us there. And sometimes they threaten our life, even our family. Uh, this question is uh, quite good. So it's full of uh, passion and challenges because every day we deal with several violations and I have to preserve myself as a human rights def defender in order to be able to prevent and to, to, to come out with a solution to, towards those violations. Uh, very active, uh, like 24-7, uh, I need to keep looking for partnership opportunities uh, to keep on doing that work. I applied for the Sakharov Fellowship Program because I believe that uh, as a practitioner I've already worked for over eight years in the field and I think I entered the field without necessarily having uh, any specialized human rights training. So this naturally attracted me to the Sakharov Fellows Program because it provides that kind of training that's useful, not just from a theoretical perspective, but as a practitioner to actually be able to sharpen your tools, take stock of what you're doing and acquire some of the new knowledge that you may need uh, to transform your work. Secondly, uh, the Sakharov uh, Prize and Sakharov Laureates have been internationally recognized as some of the Sanchez human rights defenders and there is some prestige uh, in being considered uh, a member of the Sakharov Fellowship uh, Program uh, as well as that of the European Parliament. So I was just keenly interested uh, to actually find out more about the work they do with human rights defenders. But I think the third and most important reason is at this point I've been working mainly through institutions to support human rights defenders. And I'm very, very keen as myself to become a resource for these human rights defenders. So whether they need safe passage, whether they need information on what forms of support are available from bodies such as the European Parliament, uh, I'm very keen that I should be the one to actually uh, have some of this knowledge or I can help them in a personal uh, basis rather than necessarily uh, relying on organizational uh, bureaucracy. So I think those are some of the, I, I could go on with many other reasons, but those are the three ma uh, main reasons. 
The first reason for applying Sakharov Fellowship Program was that it is the very high level program for human rights defenders, which I always wanted to be part of, and I'm really grateful to be to be granted this uh, right to be here as a participant. Uh, the second reason was to uh, enlarge my network and get to know the participants from uh, other countries, other uh, environments. Um, and the third reason is that it um, inspires you as the human rights defender with the new energy, with new goals set, so that was the reason. One is to broaden my uh, career, professional career. So the second one is to develop a network of uh, some support, a network of people who will support us. The third one is to amplify or raise the, the matter to the international body. That's why it's very important to, to apply for Sakharov years. I wanted to be uh, in the fellowship because uh, I wanted to join a global network, uh, get, get a global perspective of human rights. Um, likewise, I, I wanted to know more um, tools that I can use in my daily work. The, the main reason was to, to get this feeling refreshed of the belonging to uh, international human rights uh, community, of uh, human rights uh, defenders uh, quite spread in the whole uh, earth continents, but we are, uh, we are linked through our causes, from, from our uh, in, uh, engagement and our involvement and activism that we are conducting by heart uh, to, uh, to, towards human rights. Uh, I need to take a step back away after several uh, intense periods in my country, in Tunisia, and I, th uh, I thought that this fellowship may offers, uh, offer for me an opportunity to, to, to enrich my knowledge and to think in a more developed way uh, after two weeks of intensive trainings and very interesting trainings. After though this great uh, experience, once I, I am back home, how uh, would, be, would it be able to share this knowledge and expertise and to, to get to, to offer more from my time, from my knowledge, from my expertise as a human rights defender in a finality of improving the current, uh, the current human rights situation in Tunisia, especially among young people and vulnerable groups. Yeah, uh, although, yes, I'm coming from South Africa where we got a very good constitution and law, but the question is that application for that law is very slow. So I call for the Premier of Limpopo as part of the leader of the community to really consider uh, recognizing of the Mataba Palani to be the traditional leader of that community. Yes, uh, uh, I, I believe uh, good causes are my cause. So I invite you all to to remain critical um, and honest to your core values with integrity. Um, yes, let's make a better world together. Basically, I work uh, within uh, preventing violent extremism through developing new uh, tools and approach based on the human uh, right, uh, rights one and peace building and through the implication and the involvement of young people as vectors of change and impact. And my message would be stand for your rights, never give up and uh, we will be uh, it will be a sunlight somewhere and it's our mission and, and it's our uh, rights as human rights defenders to stand for all the, our principles and for all our causes. Uh, I believe that human rights defenders working in the East and Horn of Africa are facing some of the gravest challenges of our times. Uh, they not only have to confront with uh, governance and human rights issues, but they're also facing uh, issues uh, that are making their work even harder, such as the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic and climate change, which is accelerating humanitarian crisis in the region. Uh, I would 
I would call for increased financial support to human rights defenders working in such contexts, uh, and specifically uh, for donors, uh, especially at this time when there's a lot of attention focused on other global crises, not to forget that uh, the work of these human rights defenders is important now as it is in the future. Uh, I don't believe there's uh, and I don't believe in the choice between supporting them now or sustainability in the future. I believe both can be done at the same time. To launch a call for a concrete demands is uh, one of the reasons why I also applied Sahara Fellowship Program because I wanted to outlaw the Georgian people's will to be part of European Union because they adhere and they honor the European values. Um, I really enjoyed the part where we got to know more about how to document cases um, so we can do uh, monitoring in the future for the projects and has uh, gathered evidence. Um, I think that Venice School for Human Rights Defenders is a very good chance that refuels the human rights defenders with new energy experience network and what is most important it is the bright flash of inspiration for new goals that I had. Definitely um, participation is one of the good elements which I got. The other thing is the quality of uh, programs here. The programs and training is very quality. The third part is that it will enable me to apply for master's program in the human rights and, and democratization in any universities. So I will do that. Uh, the Venice School comes after spending a week in Brussels, the Sakharov of Fellows, and I think uh, I've been pleasantly surprised by the richness of the academic program that has been delivered in such a condensed form. Uh, a lot of this knowledge uh, most of us need for ongoing work, uh, but I have discovered elements uh, such as the one we're going through on using video and, and evidence, which is actually up to date, uh, shares tips that are practical for our work immediately we leave here or even before we leave. Uh, and also, I must say, the sense of community I get from working and coordinating with other human rights defenders. It's very interesting uh, to realize that the more that you share uh, with your fellow human rights defenders, how much you have in common, and especially how much you can actually learn from each other. I'd say uh, that discovery of this uh, specialized knowledge, uh, as well as just the joy uh, and solidarity we get from, uh, from the community, I, I feel like leaving here I'll be enriched, empowered, encouraged and connected to people who not only share or relate to what we go through uh, on a daily basis, but that will probably form friendship for the rest of our lives. Uh, it was about this feeling of belonging to this worldwide uh, human rights uh, defenders community, including uh, field activists, including experts, including academias, and this diversity about the, the participant and the fluidity of the, the discussions and, and the exchanges uh, concerning several human rights uh, causes that are uh, shared worldwide, but how we are uh, dealing with each one of uh, these causes regarding our local and regional contexts uh, differs, and this uh, how we are able to connect each other and to come in to put in common our experiences, our lesson learned in order to construct together uh, common reflection and intelligence, common collective uh, intel intelligence, collective uh, reflection. Uh, in order to to be more performant and in order to be, to be more efficient when responding to uh, human rights violation. Bye, Bye everyone. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, and I hope I see you soon.